Welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's uh, great to have had that chance in the break to talk to people and, and stretch our legs. And now we're back uh, getting involved in this discussion again. And I want to say it's wonderful to be hosted here. We're right here in the Alumni Association building for the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So it's, it's fantastic to have everybody here. And I think we all really enjoyed hearing from a terrific panel with Frank and Cheryl and Michael and Michael. And I think a lot of food for thought. And so. We'll try to keep some of those threads going, and then we're going to take a slightly different approach in what we're covering in our panel today. In particular, we're going to spend a lot of time trying to look ahead to some of the challenges and the opportunities that we see on the horizon. We're going to try to build and potentially reframe historic roles of higher education when we focus on how does higher education truly fuel the economy of tomorrow and the economies of the local regions in which we are found. How do we work to continue to regain in some cases and preserve the public trust that is so important and that you heard discussed to some extent in the last panel. And we also want to talk very specifically about what do we do in universities to help prepare a workforce that is indeed ready for the future that is coming at them. Then finally, we also want to talk a little bit about the role of preserving or the function of basic creativity-driven basic research in universities, and why do we often talk about that as such a critical part of the fuel for growth. It's uh, important to remember we've been talking in very um, broad terms about higher education. This panel is really coming from a, a very particular sector. We are all uh, members of uh, public research, great public research institutions. But we've come from a lot of other institutions. We work very, very closely with our colleagues in universities of all types. So where possible, we'll try to present that perspective. And I also may call on some of you in the audience uh, to weigh in on some of these issues as we get into the question and answer period. But do remember about 70% of the students in America are actually being trained in the public university system. It might even be larger than that growing. And about 70% of the great research that takes place in universities takes place in those great public universities. And so we really are in a very critical part of the sector that looks at higher education and its role in the future. There's a lot of uh, ways you can look at how people view education, and you heard some of them. But I think it's also important to remember that when you ask um, the public's view of science and research, 80% of the adults say that science has made life easier for most people, better for most people. And that's part of our report card, too, is what are we doing to promote the health and well-being of our societies. Seven in 10 adults say government's investments in engineering and technology and basic scientific research pay off in the long run. And 61% say that government investment is critical for research progress, while 34% say on, that are the only ones that say private investment enough is enough to actually see that go forward. I think we've, we've talked a lot about uh, views of higher education in some ways, but I think we also just alluded a little bit to the importance of higher education for the workforce of the future. So just a couple numbers to put that in place as we go on to our panel. is uh, Recently, the Georgetown Center for Education and Workforce estimated that 56 million job openings will be coming online because of growth or replacement needs over the next 10 years. 20 million will be available potentially to people with a high school degree or less. The remaining 36 plus will require college and even beyond college degrees. So we know that our job is big and our opportunities are great, and that's another aspect of what we want to talk about. We also want to bring this back to accessibility and affordability, why we want the greatest education for everybody, regardless of their background and their income. 
and we're going to spend a very uh, quick start of our panel just describing you a little bit about our particular institutions just to get a scale of where we're coming from and, and uh, the experiences we're talking about. And then, as I said, when we get to questions and answers, we'll to try to draw in some more of our colleagues. So I have an amazing panel, three people whom I admire very greatly uh, to explore some of these issues. Uh, I'll start by introducing President Teresa Sullivan, Terry Sullivan from UVA. She's been the president there for seven years. She has been a front row seat to the forces that are shaping higher education. And as you heard, she's also been a leader of a number of different panels that have really looked at this in great detail. She was one of the first people to welcome me when I became the chancellor here at UNC Chapel Hill. And we are also sit together on the ACC. And one thing I want to say is we might compete on the playing field, but these universities are very, very good and close collaborators. She came to UVA from the University of Michigan, where she was the provost and executive vice president of academic affairs. She's a very highly respected scholar in labor force demography, very relevant to the topic of the day. And University of Michigan is where our second panelist, President Mark Schlissel, now serves. Um, he has, is Michigan's 14th president, and he began serving in 2014. He and I knew each other when we were both provosts in, uh, at Ivy League institutions and worked together um, on the issues in those universities. It's a very busy time at Michigan right now, though, because they're celebrating their bicentennial year, which I think is uh, always an exciting time for a university. He's the first physician scientist to lead Michigan with extensive and very highly regarded work in immunology. So it's great to have Mark here too. And the third panelist is UNC Chapel Hill and NC State University's very own Professor Joe DeSimone. Um, everyone here who's at Chapel Hill probably knows Joe. He is a very uh, widely uh, regarded and highly esteemed faculty member here. He's also the CEO of a new company called Carbon, and that is a game-changing uh, new um, business that is rising around 3D printing company. That's just one of many companies that he's been associated with or he or his students have started, and I think it's something to be very exciting to hear his perspective. He launched this company from his research at Carolina. He's on a leave as the chancellor's eminent professor of chemistry based now in the Bay Area of Michigan, and he's also, as many of you may know, he's a a member of all three national academies, and I mention that to say that he's a very good example of interdisciplinarity and what that means when you bring that to bear in entrepreneurship. So we're very excited to have everybody here, and I'm going to use this now as a chance to start with my first question. So I'm going to ask everybody to begin by just telling a little bit about their university. And then we'll come back around and I'm going to ask him what it truly means to them to be in a great public university. So Mark, would you like to, to start? Sure, of course. So you know, first of all, thanks to Carol for the invitation. And one of the things great universities do is they convene. And they convene people to talk about uh, timely, important topics, in this case, uh, some introspection amongst universities. Uh, but I really appreciate both the moment we're in in higher ed and the opportunity to visit UNC here to talk about things that are really important to me. So the University of Michigan, as Carol said, is celebrating its 200th birthday, one of the oldest universities, uh, public universities in the United States, <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Uh, we've got uh, on our Ann Arbor campus, the, the flagship research intensive campus of our university, about 44,000 students, 29,000 undergrads, about 15,000 graduate and professional students. 19 schools and colleges, and we basically study almost the full breadth of what humans do and do research on and do teaching on. Um, we are the number two university in the country in terms of dollars spent on research, $1.4 billion last year, second to one of my alma maters, Johns Hopkins, but they cheat because they have a big federal lab and applied physics lab, so we don't count that. Uh, so very research <laughs> intensive. Um, we're very much a national public university, and perhaps it'll come up later, uh, but you know, somewhere between 45 and 47 percent of our students, uh, undergrads, come from outside the state of Michigan. Uh, and then, of course, our graduate and professional students are national and international uh, in their nature. Thank you. Terry. 
Uh, so the University of Virginia, founded by Thomas Jefferson, begins its bicentennial celebration in two weeks. Mm. And um, that celebrates the laying of the cornerstone for the university because, and this tells you something important about public institutions, Mr. Jefferson knew he could not get a charter from the legislature unless he had buildings standing. So the buildings came first and the charter came in 1819. Uh, we have an enrollment of about 23,000 students, uh, of whom about 15,000 are undergraduates, 70% of them from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Tuition this year is $15,700 for in-state students. And all in, with room and board, books and travel, cost of attendance is about $30,000 for a Virginia resident considered to be one of the best buys in American higher education. We, like North Carolina Chapel Hill, meet the full need of every student. And um, we do that with a combination of programs, including a substantial chunk of institutional aid. Um, our students have a graduation rate of about 93%. I will be happy to tell you in detail if you want to know why I think that's a terrible measure. Um, and for many years, we have had the highest graduation rate of African-American students of uh, any public university. Uh, when I arrived in Virginia from Michigan, I had lunch with the governor, and the governor said to me, I want you to raise the university's graduation rate by 10 percent. Well, we were at 92 percent then. <laughs> Double degrees. <laughs> but that tells you one of the issues that we face, <laughs> right? Which is a tendency to look at all of higher education as one. And, um, you know, higher education is highly stratified. And what you should expect in graduation rates from schools like ours is not necessarily what you would get at other institutions. And by the way, let me say, I think this is a really timely convening, and I want to thank President Spelling whom I knew when we were both Texans, and also thank Carol for giving me the opportunity to be here and interact with you. Thank you. I'll, I'll do the Chapel Hill one, and then I'm going to turn to Joe to ask him a very specific question. So, yes, I guess we celebrated our bicentennial 20-plus years <laughs> ago. <laughs> but it is, you know, this... Age before beauty. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, too. Oh. But it was the first state university in the country to open its doors and graduated its first students in the 1700s. And, and I think like all of our universities, we've taken that public mission very, very seriously from the start. And it's something that drives all of us. We have about 30,000 students here. About 18,000 of them are undergraduates, 12,000 graduate and professional students. Uh, we're about 82% of our undergraduates come from the state of North Carolina. Our uh, tuition at undergraduates is uh, less than, it's about, um, oh my gosh, I wrote that down, 87, it's $8,700 a year, so it's inexpensive, one of the least expensive great universities in the country. Um, it's something that we all work very hard to keep inexpensive, but I think all three of these institutions do an incredible job at keeping that tuition low. As a result, the debt of students here is about half that of the debt that you read about when you're hearing these stories about very high debt. It's very important. One of the other things that I think is important, and we'll probably talk about this later, is the students that come, come from all backgrounds. 14% of the students at UNC Chapel Hill come from families that have median incomes of less than $26,000 a year. And of course, we do have high numbers, high, high uh, levels of Pell students and first generations, but not the levels of Pell students and first generations that some of my colleagues here from other universities in the system have. But it's something that's also extremely important to us. And then we have a research budget that's just over $1 billion a year. So you are hearing from three institutions that are really um, in incredibly privileged positions. We have amazing students. We have incredible faculty and a long history of alumni that really do help us move forward. And so what we're partly going to focus on is what can these institutions do even better? And how can we learn and how can we be partners with institutions across the uh, country to do things in a very special way? So one thing I want to start by talking about is why or what is the special role of a public university? Because all three of us are very intentional about being here. And I'm going to start by asking Joe, because Joe is an incredible faculty member. 
like many of our faculty at all of our universities, he could be anywhere in the country or in the world. All universities are fighting for all the great talent. They want them, and they make choices about where they see they can do their impact. And I think, Joe, you tell the story about why you want to be associated with a public institution and what it means to you as well as anyone I've ever met. So can you talk a bit about that for us? Sure. <clears throat> well, it's certainly great to be with some university startups uh, here. <laughs> uh, I remember when uh, President Bill Clinton came here in, uh, in, in uh, 1993, when we celebrated our bicentennial, and it was really terrific. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, th this place is a very special place, and I sort of hark back to uh, President Bill Friday when he talked passionately about how a, a million North, Carolina, North Carolinians wake up every day to go to jobs and, and get paid wages that are below the poverty level, to pay taxes, to enable you know, our kids to get educated here and really reflecting back on what are we gonna to do to repay that. You know, it's, in, it's that mission about uh, purpose and changing the human condition, which I think uh, you know, is really a special uh, calling at a public institution. And when you think about the diversity of students that we gather from all counties in North Carolina, and you think through uh, the impact and diversity that they bring, you know, I've, I've had a lot of chance to be part of design teams in my career, and, and the students that have been part of these design teams. And you know, you could tell uh, the ideas from a student that grew up with not much money. And they're often different from a student that grew up with a lot of money. And when you're trying to really broaden the perspectives on the innovation process, gathering all those perspectives, they're all different. They're not better than one another. But it's that kind of drive that I think really is the fuel for innovation having that perspective, having that diversity of perspective, and boy, North Carolina really uh, brings that together. Thank you. Terry, can you talk a bit about your uh, belief of what the public mission is, and in some ways, why is it, or how is it different than our colleagues at the private schools? I mean, our, our universities of all sorts are needed, but we have something pretty special and has its own challenges and opportunities. Well, let me start off by talking about what I think it is not. A lot of people think the difference between public and private schools is where the money comes from. In fact, most private institutions get substantial amounts of taxpayer money, uh, directly in the form of federal financial aid or perhaps federal grants. Um, in many states, including my own, there are tuition assistance grants for students who go to private institutions. Um, and then for, you know, in other ways, there is um, uh, income tax credits and there's also uh, the deductibility of contributions to the university. So in a lot of ways, the private universities are getting many of the same streams of income the public institutions are. Um, the public institutions do typically get a general fund appropriation, and that tends to be the very last item in the hierarchy of things the legislature has to fund. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, there are mandates in all states for K through 12 in many states, they're under court order to improve their prisons. There's federal matching money for highways and Medicaid. There's nothing for higher education. So it tends to be at the bottom of the barrel in almost all states. Um, we're certainly grateful for that contribution, but that's not what makes us public. What makes us public is our mission, our governance. Um, you know, unlike private institutions, um, the governor appoints uh, all of our governing board called the Board of Visitors. Uh, you know, when I became a president, I went to Harvard to the boot camp they have for new university presidents. And in the session on dealing with your board, the first thing they said was, well, you have to pick your board very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> public presidents don't get that privilege. <laughs> so we are public by mission and by governance. And I think that that actually, for those of us who commit our lives to public higher education, is pretty exciting. The other thing I would say that I think is imp an important part of our mission, we are not just one industry, higher education, as challenging as that industry is. All of us are two industries because we are major health care providers too. Half of our faculty hold an MD degree. Half our university's revenues come from clinical care. And so we serve the public in a very important way through our clinical outreach. Uh, in our case, almost a million clinic visits a year and 60,000 telemedicine visits. That's an important part of the way we reach out to the Commonwealth. 
We also touch K through 12 in a very special way. We help produce teachers, and not enough because Virginia is importing teachers right now, but we also have done a lot of work using the best science available to, to improve curricula so that we hope to touch K through 12 in many ways, not just the students who come from K to 12, K through 12 to us. So I see all of those as ways that we hope we imbue um, our faculty with a sense of public mission. For our students, we have a long-standing program of student self-governance that goes all the way back to our early founding. And we see ourselves as preparing students for lives of purpose, but also preparing them to be engaged citizens. And um, that, too, is part of our public mission. We want students to leave not thinking it's everybody else's responsibility to keep the republic going. It's also their responsibility. Hmm. Thank you. Mark. Uh, well, you know, I end up, as I often do, echoing much of what Terry has to say. Um, I think there is, though, a, a growing convergence in some respects between uh, public and private universities. Uh, I think some of that is coming as our governments uh, at the state level disinvest in public higher education. Uh, and it's also coming as our great private universities embrace things that we claim as part of our public mission, you know, doing research for the public good. Um, you know, I've worked at great public universities, and of course they stand up and they say we're doing research for the public good. Um, but uh, I think uh, uh, universities like Michigan and Virginia and, and Carolina, um, what we differ is in terms of scale. So we're larger uh, on average than the typical private universities. Uh, I think we embrace the idea of being especially accessible to the full economic, socioeconomic strata within our state, first of all, and, and then secondarily, more broadly than that. Um, uh, but it's this place-based nature. So a lot of our research at Michigan, for example, has grown up alongside the automobile industry. And now we're amongst the leading places studying autonomous mobility. And we've got an open source research facility targeted towards cooperating with the private sector and developing the next generation of mobility. We have big research programs in water, and of course the Great Lakes contain m much of the fresh water uh, on Earth or contained in the Great Lakes, and we're a Great Lakes state. So the focus of our research uh, grew up along with the economic needs of our state, and I think uh, that's a, a continuing legacy. But uh, also, you know, Terry mentioned something quite important, being a, an enormous healthcare provider at the same time we're teaching the next generation of docs. Uh, uh, we have a huge impact on the delivery of healthcare, uh, but we're also a, a cultural center. You know, music and theater and the arts uh, enrich the public we serve, again, in a place-based fashion. Uh, we all run something that, you know, no one's mentioned yet. Uh, some call it intercollegiate sports and others call it a sports entertainment business. Uh, but uh, that's very much part of the culture and that's very much a, a public university uh, kind of thing. Um, we're interested in focusing research on the great problems of the day and generating, uh, graduating students that feel um, a responsibility not just to themselves but to the, uh, the public that helped them get this great education. That's, I mean, I think these are wonderful, and I, I'm not going to add to any of those for Chapel Hill just because I think we all speak in a very similar way, but I'm going to add a couple more that I think great public universities do. Um, and one way I like to think of what makes public is I think it means that we're here to stay. We don't ever get to pull out. When it's tough or when it's good, we're here to stay. When we go out into local communities and do service, we don't just pull out if the funding goes away. We're here to stay, and I think it's a very special and unique part of what makes public universities so much um, a part of the local communities, and I think we could all talk about that service mission. I do think I want to reinforce what I heard said, is that innovation in public universities, almost every time you talk to a faculty there, they talk about it in the public good which doesn't mean we don't create great innovators who make wonderful companies and have wonderful outcomes in their own lives, but they think about it so often about how it actually spreads and innovates in health, in public service, in the arts, in the public good. And I think I just want to then reinforce that service mission is probably each one of us, it would say, education, 
we'd say research, and then we'd say service. So those are, are special about the public university. So one of our goals today was really to talk about a public lack of trust, potentially, or maybe just a public seeking for answers about what is the return on investment. And yes, they may not be paying for the bulk of what we do, but they are still contributing, and they're asking what's the return on investment. And they're saying, we're, we say, we generate major changes in the local economies. We are, are really producing value back. So I want each of, of uh, the presidents and Joe specifically to talk a bit about how your university supports your faculty to drive economic growth in your region, nation, and then we'll come back and go back through and say, are we really doing our job to increase the economic mobility of our graduates? So if I start with Joe, you can give us the, the perspective from the faculty what does work in supporting their uh, entrepreneurial and um, economic generation, and what could we do a lot better to make it possible for our faculty to do that and our students? Well, it's, you know, it's interesting when you think about innovation and you do it from a, uh, an economic point of view. I think Clay Christensen talks about the, how there's three kinds of innovations. You know, the sort of breakthrough innovations that are really game-changing, that create jobs, new jobs, by the, by the millions. Uh, and a second class would be the sustaining innovations, those innovations that sustain entire new industries and think about the automotive industry and, you know, they're not really growing but it's a vibrant part of our economy and, you know, I think keeping 20 to 30 percent of their products as new products is an important part of an industry like that. And then there's efficiency innovations, those breakthroughs that, you know, drive, auto, you know, perhaps automation, make things much more efficient and there's often a really great return on investment, but often those are job-killing uh, innovations. And when you think about, you know, where are you in those three categories of innovation, it, it's really uh, important to acknowledge that they all play an important role. And if you're an investor or you're thinking about your, uh, your investment portfolio, you like all of those. Um, but, you know, when you think about jobs, you know, we think more about the first and second in, in a lot of different ways. And so, you know, at a public university, uh, there, you know, this is really where a lot of innovation happens, but the translation of those to jobs takes a lot of further on investments. And one of the things I take a lot of pride with, I see my colleague Holden Thorpe uh, back here, you know, the policies we have at Carolina uh, are among the best for technology transfer uh, in the nation. And uh, this is really essential in, in order to be effective in contributing to the jobs. And, um, you know, if, if one of my colleagues today, if she invents a new um, a, a, a solution to HIV or Ebola, and if she were to publish that work prior to filing a patent, for example, the, you know, the follow-on hundreds of millions of dollars investment to translate that into an actual cure probably wouldn't happen. And so there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes to drive protecting technologies. Um, you know, a, a lot of people think patents stifle innovation. You know, I'm, I'm in the other camp. I think it drives innovation because it drives a follow-on investments. And, and having a university that's thoughtful about these processes in order to, to translate and create new jobs is, is really important. And I, and I think facilitating that, engage, having faculty engage with the public. I think a lot of faculty are really great problem solvers. Um, but they often don't know where the problems are, and so it's a, it's a process of engagement. This is a contact sport, and another hallmark feature of Carolina, I think we do really, really well, is we have low barriers uh, between departments and disciplines. You know, a lot of the best stuff today is, a, is convergence of disciplines coming together, and uh, you know, the, the fact that chemistry faculty can partner with the School of Medicine through the School of Pharmacy, the fact that our colleagues in the humanities understand the context, if you do earthquake research and you want to have an impact in Haiti, you need to understand the French culture and the French language. And having all that come together to be really effective in making impact is, is what we can do, we, we do well. And we've got to pay attention to the, to the barriers between disciplines to foster where a lot of the good stuff is between. That's great. Mark, I'll mix up the order here. Um, so, uh, I think public universities in particular, but really all research universities, there's been a culture shift, at least from my seat, 
through the course of my career. So I, I'm a biomedical scientist. I study the, studied for many years the developmental biology of the immune system and the origins of leukemia and lymphoma. And for the longest time, um, uh, the culture at universities was to study things that were interesting and let other people worry about things that are practical and getting those ideas out into uh, public use. Uh, but I think in recent decades, and particularly at public universities, um, many, many faculty have become personally concerned about the impact that their work has on the public that we're all serving. Um, the old school is, you know, you get a grant, you publish a bunch of papers, you get a promotion, you get the next grant, and, and you keep turning that crank. But now I really think the value system has turned towards uh, uh, societal utility and societal benefit. Uh, I think universities during those years have improved their IP policies, their tech transfer policies uh, to promote the protection of IP, as Joe mentioned, to help market that IP into the private sector, and now most recently to find ways to invest in our own IP at the very early stages to make them attractive for either companies to purchase or for faculty members to begin their own companies, as Joe has begun uh, several, uh, to really get the products of our uh, scholarship uh, into the hands of people where society can benefit directly. Um, I want to uh, push a little further, though, past uh, the first thing everyone thinks of is that the first thing we think of are engineers or chemical engineers or, or physicians. Um, but our, our social scientists and humanists are creating knowledge and understanding uh, that we're also trying to push out into the public space. And if you think about what the great problems are that we're confronting as a society, uh, although growing the economy and, and maintaining global competitiveness is certainly a great problem, you know, we're still stuck on learning how to get along with one another in civil society, hmm. uh, right? And that's an everyday thing, and that's a thing that can overwhelm us when we get it wrong. It can, it can change, it can result in uh, elections that are hard to understand and, and civil discourse, which is threatened. And I think the academy has a research universities and our scholars from the humanities and social sciences ha have a huge role to play in that. Uh, I think universities uh, are more open and engage in public-private partnerships. Uh, our, our efforts around autonomous mobility is all based on public-private partnerships. Um, uh, I saw one of your alums here, uh, Doug uh, 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 Rothwell, is um, the uh, head of a group in Michigan called the Business Leaders of Michigan that includes universities working alongside CEOs uh, trying to brainstorm what are the future best interests of the state and how do we develop a shared strategy between education and economic development and the private sector in an era where government doesn't seem to be doing that. So again, partnerships with the uh, uh, private sector have become uh, very important. And the last thing I'll say is um, the academy, research universities, public research universities, are almost the only places now that do basic research, fundamental discovery research, that doesn't have a short-term view on the market, but on a time course of decades opens up entirely new industries and transforms economies. Uh, the biotechnology industry was created by basic researchers at great universities. The computer industry, the IT industry, is similarly created. And these things, um, companies can't invest in these things. The returns are too long and uncertain. But again, a huge portion of our value to society is the ability to make long-term investments and have scholars do things purely on interest and discovery potential that ultimately uh, fuel global competitiveness for us. I mean, it's really great to hear you talk about the breadth of these things. I'm going to pull a, a trick from the first panel <laughs> and ask you to give a grade. <laughs> but. Um, because I think we all believe, and maybe even in the 10 years, I'd really say this since the, the commission, that the burst of energy in entrepreneurship and the translation has really been a big focus of universities' interests. But where do you think we sit? I mean, can we do better? And, and if we were to pick two or three things you'd say that could accelerate that even further, what would you each say, sort of a quick look on that? Well, I would start by saying we learned last year in a study done by an external consultant that Virginia alumni have created 800,000 jobs for Virginians. Now, the Virginia labor force is 4 million people, so we're responsible for 20% of the jobs, not 
directly because the university didn't directly create those jobs, but we gave the alumni the ability to go out and do it, even though we weren't emphasizing entrepreneurship, particularly in the curriculum. That's changed, like many institutions today. Um, we have um, a minor in entrepreneurship that can be pursued by students in any major. Uh, we have extracurricular events in which students compete with one another with inventions. A group of our students won the National Collegiate Inventors Award this year. Um, that's a change. It's a big change, and I've seen it over my career, I think, as Mark has, um, you know, just in terms of how faculty are oriented and, and the sorts of things they want to do. We used to drive the entrepreneurial faculty out. Now we embrace them and try to bring them in. That's a big change. When I first got to Virginia, we had an organization called the Patton Foundation, and a few faculty explained to me sourly that this was the foundation designed to keep faculty from getting patents. That sort of didn't seem the right objective, and so we've reorganized that substantially into a licensing and ventures group. <clears throat> we've looked for best practices in terms of IP and technology transfer, mm -hmm. as you have at, mm -hmm. at Carolina, um, and it has quite transformed the way we approach. Like Michigan, we also invest early in uh, some of the IP of our own uh, faculty and in some cases graduate students and have tried to change the ecosystem of the university from one in which only the traditional scholarly paper is valued to one in which a variety of things are accepted and valued as a sign of intellectual output. And you get more of what you reward. Mm -hmm. Give us a grade. Uh, you know, I think it's hard to do it for public higher education as a whole. You know, I would say it's probably a B for the very best schools and it's probably an F for the ones who are still rejecting their entrepreneurial faculty. Yeah, how about you, Mark? Yeah, I was gonna argue, and it's too bad Frank has left, because I'm sure these bad grades are gonna show up in a column in the Times in a couple of days. <laughs> uh, but I was gonna argue to get my grade improved, I'll tell you. Um, so uh, I think American research universities, to be sure, and the majority of them uh, by volume are public research universities, are the unargued leaders in the world. You know, we produce the most Nobel Prize winning scientists, the most economy transforming inventions. Um, we're a magnet for talent from all, think of the advantage our country accrues when we open our doors, as we should fight to keep them open, to the most talented, hardworking people from around the world that want to make their lives better by becoming educated and then contributing to discovery and the economies at our universities. So we're a magnet for talent. Uh, the research productivity of our universities is unmatched around the world. So on that spectrum, I give us an A. Uh, where I think the real challenge is, and, and I think it was weighing heavily on the minds of the panelists uh, a little bit earlier this morning, is on accessibility to that education across the full breadth of the socioeconomic strata in our nation. And I think uh, an era, so the other day, uh, I had the pleasure, one of the great joys of being university president is you get to host great visitors to the university. So Colin Powell came to Michigan the other day and gave a very inspiring session with our students in Hill Auditorium, 3,000 people is great. And here's a guy, the son of a Jamaican immigrant parents, grows up in the South Bronx, a uh, smart, talented young man, very ambitious, uh, got into lots of colleges, but could only afford City College of New York, which came up earlier today. And of course, he goes to City College, he discovers ROTC, becomes a general, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, National Security Advisor, Secretary. There are kids like that everywhere. It's not that Colin Powell's are a dime a dozen, but we're leaving out a huge sector of our talent pool we struggle to identify them. They're not really well prepared in ways that are easy for us to see and measure. And our society is missing out on all that productivity. And not only are we missing out on the productivity, but when you undereducate somebody with capacity, we end up, in effect, subsidizing them and their family for a long portion of their life. So uh, I think that's where we're really struggling to have a passing grade, is the ability to identify talented kids all across the spectrum of our economy, find ways to bring them to the great universities and educate them to their potential and then we'll just see an enormous benefit. Uh, diversity, we talk about a lot and we tend to racialize it or think about ethnicities, but there are myriad forms of diversity in our society, all of which can contribute to our success. Uh, geographical, socioeconomic diversity, cultural diversity of all different kinds 
can make your research group stronger, you were mentioning, can improve uh, the nature of education on our campuses, and that's where we're truly, truly struggling. It's uh, interesting when people talk about this leveraging all the research that happens here, and, and when we do that, we usually talk about the dollar, the, the research that carries money with it, but there is, of course, so much other research that comes without dollars that has huge benefit. But so I'm sure your, your campuses have each done this. We've done these sorts of analyses. We, we uh, contribute to the economies with all the people who work here. Huge numbers of people work here. We did an analysis recently and said for our billion dollars of research uh, money that we bring in that isn't money that comes from the state, it comes from out of the state in here, $70 million a year goes to buy equipment to run these projects all bought from North Carolina companies. So the types of way we leverage this in real economic value is great. That those are sports uh, attraction. I think a million people come to this part of the state every year to go to games. So when you think about that, they're coming in, they're infusing it. But when you look at the research dollars itself, we've seen, I think you've participated in those panels, it's something like a three to seven dollar investment uh, leveraging. So if you bring in a billion dollars, probably seven billion, three to seven billion dollars are coming in. So that puts it in all this money way, and that's, a, that's an important way to look at it. But I think we were hearing from the early panelists, they want to know how is this also affecting social mobility of our students. And so I'd love to hear your opinions about that. Do you think that the research universities play a particular role in social mobility that might be different from our sister universities of different types? Or Joe, even going directly to you, do you see your research, your hands-on learning, has that seemed to you to be particularly important in educating students from various backgrounds to see a whole realm of possibilities that they didn't know existed. And oh. I know you, you talk about that a lot. Yeah, for sure. Um, this is an interesting week for me. I'm uh, finishing up seven or six PhD students this week, um, two at NC State, four uh, here at Carolina. So it's been a busy few weeks for all of us. Uh, and I'm approaching about 80 doctoral students in my career now. And half of those have been from women and underrepresented groups in the sciences. And to me, that that is that fabric of, of innovation, and I think Having everybody participate in that activity uh, has been essential and it has really been impactful for their careers. You know, Valerie Ashby is now dean at Duke University, my first PhD student, African-American woman here, and, and just, you know, there are many stories like that that are, that are playing out. Uh, you know, I, I think we do improve things a lot, but there is this, uh, and I'm really bullish on the research enterprise and the impact on, on the new economies. But there is this large gap, right? There's so many of our citizens in North Carolina that are disenfranchised, right? And you think about the, this is a very rural state. And you think about what are we doing, you know, to really help out, and you think about Eastern North Carolina or Appalachia, and, and to think about what are, the, what are the things that we can be doing more to drive economic capabilities. And, and uh, you know, always thought a lot, we, we have a lot of hogs in North Carolina, and there's, there's a lot of things that come with hogs that. Uh, are actually fuel for a lot of opportunities and, and you know, making the commitment to biomass and biofuels and think about what we can do more broadly to be uh, focused on that are the kinds of things that, you know, the upper mobil the, the mobility for the people coming here is terrific, but the opportunity for us as a university to help mobility f to lift everyone in the state is, uh, is something we, sh we need to be f continually focused on. Can I ask Joe a question? Sure. How do you manage to attract such a diverse group of P doctoral students into your lab in an environment where they're underrepresented overall? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, you know, I th we're a destination, I think. You know, I think it starts with momentum. You know, we had, I had uh, students in the early 90s. I was, uh, I, was, I was invited to be a keynote lecturer, and it's when... Um, there was a ban in, Cal in South Carolina because of the Confederate flag. And my, my group was very diverse and we spoke about it as a group and we decided we weren't gonna go. And, um, and, and it was an American Chemical Society meeting and they moved the meeting to a different state because we decided we weren't gonna go. Wow. And that was written up in Chemical and Engineering News and you know, it takes on a life of its own and, you know, and, and realize that there is a, uh, there is a focus like that. 
And so I, you know, and, and, and I say that our chemistry department is just full of faculty that think that way, right? And I see it in the medical school. I, I see it in the school of pharmacy, right? There is a passion about that here, that uh, Carolina is a destination uh, for people that want to make a difference, that know that they get a fair shake, and that high expectations are, are there. And so it's, that's, a, that's a part of who we are, I think. Terry, can you talk a bit about if you believe there's a special role for social mobility by your big R1 public global universities? I mean, what do we do, or, and what could we do better to take that very seriously? Well, we have an obligation to the Commonwealth to take 70% of our undergraduates. That gives us a perfect hunting ground to look for the talented students who might otherwise be overlooked. Uh, so we began a project called the Virginia 80, where we identified 80 high schools that were not sending us applications on a regular basis. And we went out to talk to those high schools. We gave their counsel, we brought their counselors at our expense to the university to see some of the things we're doing. Many of these school districts don't have the money for their counselors to do uh, much of anything. And the counselors often have such huge uh, uh, loads, advising loads, they don't have much time to help the college-bound student. They've got students with much worse problems that they have to deal with. Um, the prototype for the college advising corps started at Virginia, and we still have an active Virginia college advising corps. These are new graduates from UVA who commit to go to a school district for two years and work with students at high schools that are typically low-income high schools just to talk with those students about what college is like, about how you fill out an application. They sit there and do FAFSA forms with them. As you know, the FAFSA by itself is almost an obstacle to going to college because it's so hard to fill out. Um, you know, and these are ways we're trying to reach the schools that have not traditionally sent us many students. Once you can get one or two students from one of these high schools to come and they become successful, the word spreads quickly and you begin to get then more and more applications from that part of the state. So we've worked really hard to increase the geographic balance inside the state. Now the other thing is we have lots and lots of out-of-state applications and uh, it is very competitive to get into UVA from out-of-state. Um, and many of those are the children of our alumni. And they feel that they got to move up the ladder because they went to Virginia. They want the same thing for their children. But the truth is their children could also be admitted at many other schools. So that poses a particular bind for us. One other thing I would say is that we, this conversation has been focused on upward mobility. But ever since 2008, there's been a huge fear of falling in the American middle class. And so I don't think we should take it for granted that the middle class families have it made. They very much do not feel they have it made. They're worried about their own jobs. They're worried about what advice to give their children about jobs. Nothing looks safe after 2008. Um, and they're concerned about rising tuition and similar issues. So the, the lower class is certainly something that we all need to be concerned about and the people who have been systematically disenfranchised. I think we also make a mistake if we overlook the fears many middle class families have about their own future and the future for their children. When you think about um, social mobility at Michigan, I think it's probably a bit the same for Virginia and for uh, UNC Chapel Hill, many of our universities. I mean, one of the things I heard the first panel talk about was that there are there problems with that whole metric. And I loved the comments that were made about trying to assess the importance of a life based on salary. But also remember, we train doctors, we, we train nurses, we train teachers, we train entrepreneurs. We train people to go do jobs that ca get paid very different amounts that don't, I think, reflect their value to society, but might affect some single metric about how much money your graduates make. So do you think that that's a special issue for a large research university, or how does that affect the way you think about social mobility for, for Michigan? That's a, well, it's I've a got big a, question for us. A downward mobile daughter who's a social work graduate student, uh, and you know, she complains about this all the time. Um, so I'm not as hung up on the evils of using um, uh, salary 10 years out of college as a metric. If someone comes up with a better one, I'm happy to substitute it. Uh, that salary metric gets averaged across thousands of kids doing many different jobs. 
So um, if you're in an environment where everyone go, where half the kids go into investment banking and half the kids go into social work, it'll have a pretty high average income because of the kids going into investment banking, and we're still putting half our kids into social work. So I think uh, until someone comes along with, uh, with a better metric of employability uh, th that uh, you can get based on social security numbers in collaboration with the IRS database, you know, that's where, that's, we measure things that are easy to measure. Come up with something better, I'm happy to do it. But I think this harkens back to a little bit of the discussion from this morning about the, what is the value, what are we looking for in education? Are we educating a kid for a job or are we educating them for a lifetime of being a, a knowledgeable, thoughtful, fulfilled citizen and, and neighbor and community member? And of course the answer is both. And I think, if anything, we may be skewing too much at the um, uh, uh, flagship, uh, I don't want to use the word elite because it's pejorative, elite but not elitist universities. Um, we're, we're skewing too much towards um, uh, kids getting their first job and everyone wants their son or daughter to be an engineer, they want them to get a business degree, so that that first job you can see how it's going to come. But if you think about the economy today and the economy when we were looking for our first jobs, there are whole sectors that didn't exist. So what we really have to do is educate our students for a lifetime of jobs uh, and not to denigrate the power of engineering or of biomedical research or of a business degree, but a plain old liberal arts degree can set you up for a lifetime in industries we have now and industries that haven't been invented yet. So I just think we have to broaden our mind, realize there are things that are easy to measure, take them with a grain of salt, look for better metrics, and just not get so hung up on it. I was having a great meeting with uh, a group of recent graduates, last 10 years, and it's just so exactly what you said. I sort of said, okay, everyone raise your hand if you're in the first job you took after graduation. And there were only like two people out of 30 that were still yeah. in the first job, and the majority were in the third job. And these were all people very excited about these changes that they were making. And that was really the way you're just and exactly One right. of the things we're investing in our liberal arts college, we call it the Opportunity Hub. But essentially, it's a connection between academic advising, internships, and career advising. So taking a history major or an English major or a Spanish major who are studying what they love, right, and showing them how that path that can lead them on a pathway to their first and then a series of jobs. I think we have to be proactive. We're trying to be proactive about it. And I'm going to come to that, uh, ask each of you to give a little bit of thought about whether we are doing what we, or what could we do better at our universities to actually prepare students to really embrace that rate of change? Our, or maybe we don't need to, maybe they're just coming to us that way, but are we adjusting our curriculum and our programs in order to make that um, as preparing for change as it used to be preparing for content. I mean, you still need content, but change is probably much more important to you. So Joe, do you want to talk? I mean, you still are teaching, and you're trying to get your students <coughs> able to switch as quickly as you do to new ideas. What's the, what's the, the trick there? Well, you know, certainly the, the, the liberal arts is that, um, you know, if you're comfortable with change, then you're really poised, right, to, to compete. And that's, you know, this whole lifelong learning, whether you're a chemistry major or a history major or, but in that broader context with the great books and being able to be fluid and, and uh, effectively competing. Um, you know, I think when we look at students today, you know, I think when I was coming through early in my career, they had the metaphor of I-shaped people and, and T-shaped people and, you know, very singularly focused in a domain and the I-shaped and then the metaphor T-shaped, you know, deep in a subject but able to collaborate. You know, I think, I think that's passe and, I, you know, I think the metaphor is more appropriate today of of pie-shaped or comb-shaped, right? And that you're, you're deep in multiple areas. And, because um, I think the T-shaped metaphor was more about a common language and it often dumbed things down. And, you know, when you think about pie-shaped and, and comb-shaped, you're, you're multilingual. And you're, and there's a lot more expected of people. And, but that multilingual can be understanding the, the basics of, of a liberal arts education in a particular discipline. And, and it's, I think it's those students that, in many ways like polymaths that are, you know, finding an opportunity to, to bridge their interests, find out what they're great at, uh, and being able to make a difference and having them uh, empowered and see the opportunities. I, you know, those are the kinds of people we're trying to hire at Carbon. 
you know, we live at the intersection between hardware engineering, software engineering, and molecular science. And, and do that in a business context, do that with thinking about the economies in the Midwest. A lot of our printers are going into, you know, Milwaukee and Cincinnati and Cleveland and Raleigh and, and a lot of different, you know, Southern California and places where people make stuff. And, but to have the context of what it means to be bringing high technology into this, this Rust Belt-like environment and, and to do it with, with uh, you know, a soft hand and understand what it means, to, what they're going through is an important part of bringing high technology forward and, and having people that have that kind of breadth of understanding uh, to make a difference is, is you know, what we look for. When you think about the liberal arts, people used to say, as you said, that T-shaped depth and breadth and a lot of people say it's now become depth, breadth, and practice. Yeah. That the real goal, and in particular, maybe this is the goal of, of our universities, is to make sure that no one is graduating without having had in-depth, hands-on experience in the creation of new knowledge or the building of new businesses. And I'm curious, are we making it possible for our faculty to actually do that, or are we burdening them with that job without actually giving them the tools to do it. What do you, how do you think about that? Because it is a, it's another thing that we expect for our students, and it is also something we expect for our faculty. Who'd like to start on that one? Well, one of our problems in holding down costs, of course, is that we've, you know, in an effort not to hire more people, we have tend to burden our current faculty with more duties. And going up to scale on something like, say, capstone experiences for students, which are a great way for them to integrate their college education across a number of things they might have studied, but that's very labor intensive for the faculty member. And um, I think it is hard for us to figure out the appropriate ways to do that. On the other hand, I think it's really essential. Um, UVA has been part of the Purdue Gallup study of alumni to um, have an opportunity to look at something besides earnings as a metric of how well um, the alumni feel engaged in their world of work and in other domains. And one of the things that the Gallup-Purdue study has found, and this is over a variety of institutions, is that an alumnus is two times more likely to be engaged in their work, that is, excited, interested, happy about what they're doing, if somebody mentored them when they were in college. And so that need to find a mentor and somebody who can listen to your aspirations and, and help pull them along, the way I think Joe does with his students, it's really important. That, that, that intrinsic problem, though, is that the student-faculty ratio, that key ratio which we talk about for that experience, that excellence, is also the same ratio for what some would think is inefficiencies, right? That's amazing, right? I mean, to have those kind of one-on-one -on -one experiences are what makes, make, makes this so special, but it's that same relationship, that same ratio that I think challenges the, the, the economic impact of what we're talking about. And so I think understanding that that is the challenge and how do we find those opportunities uh, when we think about our state legislatures that are trying to get kids through the pipeline, right. right? We don't have the opportunity for kids to try classes anymore to find out what they're not good at or what they don't like. Right, that's a real challenge, and, and uh, to recognize that if we really want the outcomes, kids gotta f have got to have an opportunity to find out what they're not great at. They've got to have these, these experiences with the faculty, and those are inefficiencies when you're having a different topic or a different consideration, but it's the same ratio. See, there may be some hope, though. We spoke a little bit this morning about um, online modes of education. And I think one of the ways that online education can enhance on-campus education is how faculty members spend their time. So if you can take a fraction of the time you usually spend with students and turn it into online modules, and then spend the time that gets liberated by that activity uh, with students doing mentoring activities, uh, having more engaged learning opportunities, more problem-focused uh, activities, they, and the rubric around this, is, or the lingo, is flipping the classroom. Uh, I think that is a way to use technology, not to save money, because we still, we still want those faculty members there. We want their time, but we want their time employed more advising students and working right. with them one-on-one. -on -one. And another aspect of what came up this morning that speaks to this is this idea of entrepreneurship. In all of our schools, it's a buzzword, all of our schools have entrepreneurship programs. 
But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is teach students uh, the personal agency of identifying the problem they're interested in working on and then feeling like they own it and they're the one who's going to go out and solve it, right? And they're going to learn what they need to to solve that problem. They're going to get advice. They'll fail from time to time. But, but giving them this empowerment of being a personal entrepreneur, not necessarily just in the business sense, but in how they approach their lives and their jobs, is part of the education we're trying to give that also speaks to this more engaged aspect of, of, of learning. Well, and one of the ways the big research universities do do that is through the team-based research. So I, was, I often tell students in, in this $1 billion that faculty bring in to Carolina, you couldn't find a single laboratory that doesn't have undergraduates in there. And so they're all learning and graduate students. And I do think this is something, when I look at the darkening horizon, I worry about the investment in that discovery-based research because not only does it lead to the inventions of the future, it is the biggest training ground in America for undergraduates and graduates. And I heard a, sto a fairly sobering statistic. Right now we spend in health $3 trillion a year. Well, do you know how much money the NIH spends a year on research in health? Three trillion in the costs of it. 32 billion. It is such a gap between the amazing talent and the pools we want to train and the work that they need to do to start dealing with uh, even the healthcare issues that there is a tremendous gap there. And so I think all of these universities have this very special role through the activities of the faculty to do it. So I think I want to open it up to questions because I know people have a lot of questions for you and we didn't even talk about what we read about each other every day when we pick up the newspaper uh, for what is also going on as the open space of democracy that all great public universities are and we're happy to answer any questions about that. So if people have questions, you might start getting ready for that. We're also interested for colleagues that run different sorts of universities for ours, how you see this relationship between entrepreneurship, economic value, and your own uh, teaching mission. So why don't I see if there's some questions out there, and um, we can start there. I think I see one right there. To this question of human capital and infrastructure that the previous panel talked about and you've talked about also. Um, it seems to me uh, on this campus I've noticed that related to the tremendous productivity in research and healthcare, you have some inter, in, um, intermediary institutions like the Institute for the Arts and Humanities, Social Sciences, the Carolina Population Center, Health Sciences, Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. So would you talk a, a bit about the role of these, inter and most recently, the Eshelman Institute for Innovation. Would you talk a little bit about the role of these mediating institutions um, and their contribution to creating this atmosphere of innovation and entrepreneurship? I love that. I'm going to turn it to my colleagues because we all have them. These are sort of the interdisciplinary centers, mostly funded by external research dollars, but homes where great minds can come together to do things that they can't necessarily do as part of their department structure. So probably you, maybe each one of you could talk about one example of one and how that works to function. Either one you've started, well, I think you started the nanotech one here, or ones that are happening at your University. Yeah, I certainly see these. I, I see what we do as, as a matrix organization, right, where you have uh, horizontally have departments, uh, core disciplines that contribute, you know, core knowledge and, uh, and then some of these verticals which bring communities together from different departments that are where a lot of good stuff happens. And, you know, I think they provide a, and I, and I think it's essential to have a matrix organization where you have um, interests coming together that are aligned with particular topic areas because a lot of great stuff happens in those centers and institutes and whether it's Lineberger or, you know, we had, a, we had an NSF Science and Technology Center for 10 years and a Cancer Nanotech, the Institute for Advanced Materials. You know, they, they bridge a lot of different disciplines and it's an essential part of, of getting stuff done and bringing like-minded people together that uh, want to make a difference in those, in those uh, verticals. A very large fraction of our research dollars actually goes through our centers because they are that intellectual mm -hmm. creativity hub. Um, 
So I think you know these centers and institutes are there to solve a problem we have, and the problem is uh, our academic landscape is divided up into disciplines that are centuries old. <laughs> so you know there are there are chemists and biologists and physicists and English professors and historians, etc., and they're in traditional <laughs> groupings. Uh, so the, we haven't blown up these traditional groupings. We've added layers on top of them, so mechanisms to bring people together. I guess one I'll mention at Michigan, which is unusual, is IHPI, Institute for Health Policy and Innovation. Uh, it's an internal research and think tank around uh, healthcare policy and how to deliver healthcare more efficiently um, and how to integrate the healthcare we deliver. Uh, it's led by a person from our School of Medicine, but 10 of our 19 schools have faculty members, and there are five or 600 faculty that are part of this institute. So social work and business and law and education and public policy have as much to do with this as public health and medicine does. And they share a building, um, uh, so they're physically co-localized. Uh, they have some internal money that we use to start it, which is often the case, and now they're self-sustaining by getting lots of outside uh, support. And amongst the things they did is they designed Michigan's implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So Michigan got a waiver and was able to implement it their mm -hmm. way, and it was done with this, in effect, university think tank. So why don't I see if there's another question, and I'll have Terry answer the next question. Look like there are a couple over there. I see one of my colleagues, Robin Cummings from Pem UNC Pembroke. Uh, love to have you give your perspective, Robin. Hi, Carol. Appreciate the opportunity. I uh, did want to, you know, as I sat here and, and talk I, and listen, I think it's important that maybe some of us uh, offer our perspective, a different perspective. As I listened to you describe your institutions, I felt like uh, a moped versus a Mercedes, and the comparison <laughs> stops there. You know, we, uh, UNC Pembroke is a school of about 6,300 students, um, master's granting institution, located in the poorest state, uh, poorest county in the state, uh, with a lot of challenges. So we really do, when it comes to entrepreneurship and how we make ourselves relevant, going back to the prior discussion, we've decided that UNC Pembroke wants to be that engine that agent of change for Southeast North Carolina, much like my friend over here, um, uh, Cecil at East Carolina and what they're doing in Eastern North Carolina. I think the way that uh, the disconnect that we talked about earlier that folks have is that folks really do not see how the university is impacting their life. So just a quick couple of examples. We have a business incubator that's located in a, an 80-year-old building in downtown Pembroke that the school went out and we, we refurbished the building. And now we have over a dozen uh, new idea businesses located there. Folks come in to us. It's, it's under the uh, School of Business. And we talk to them. We help them flesh out their idea. We celebrated this past week by graduating our first business out of that incubator. And it's a business that is associated with the local Lumbee tribe. It's an 8A organization. And this particular business has the potential by September 30th to close on $300 million worth of business. Now that is impactful. People hear about that and that's relevant and the, the university is driving the economy in that area. And we have additional businesses in the, in the incubator that we're working with in the same way. Likewise, with our School of Nursing, we graduate 40 nurses, could graduate more if we, if we could um, afford the faculty, but we graduate 40 students a year, and the majority of those students stay in that area, and they, and they practice in that area. We have a strong uh, social work program. We have a strong uh, counseling program. Students tend to stay in southeast North Carolina once they graduate. The legislature uh, this year provided for a study to be performed by the Board of Governors, the purpose of, of that study is to look at the health professions that are needed in Southeast North Carolina, and, and they are legion, there are many, and how could UNC Pembroke meet those needs? And so we're working now with the Shep Center and with GA in order for that study to be done, and we're looking forward to, to those results. So finally, through the uh, recent NC bond, uh, UNC Pembroke was awarded 
$23 million to assist us in building a new facility for our School of Business. It's an accredited School of Business. It's growing 10% plus each year. Again, most of those students tend to stay in Southeast North Carolina, although many go elsewhere as well. But we will be building this state-of-the-art School of Business starting next year, and uh, the community sees that as positive. I've had so many business owners tell me, you have no idea how hard it is for me to attract the kind of talent that I need to run my business here in Robinson County and in, in Southeast North Carolina. Uh, you having a school here, those students again will stay here. So just talking about the entrepreneurship and how uh, universities can impact the, the world in which they lead, uh, live, we see ourselves as being that driver, that economic, that cultural, and that educational driver for Southeast North Carolina. Thanks, Robin. I also want to mention he too is a physician uh, scholar head of his university and a Chapel Hill graduate, so very pleased to have him speak. <laughs> Thomas, did you, or you, would you like to? That'd be great. Yeah, wh while you're talking about Chapel Hill, I'm going to put in a plug for in No, never mind. <laughs> w one of the things that I, I wanted to mention, uh, if I had to grab a theme for today, it, it would, and I actually sat here and I bought, I purchased uh, Frank Bruni's book while I was, was sitting here, uh, that the idea that where you go doesn't determine who you are is, is a big deal. Uh, I, I uh, am the chancellor at the smallest uh, four-year institution in the system, but it's important to understand in northeastern North Carolina, Elizabeth City State University, but even at the smallest institution in the UNC system, I'm the third largest employer in the county that I, I operate in. Uh, the conversation about entrepreneurship in our area is important to the region because the region was built, North Carolina essentially was built on entrepreneurship as a, uh, as a, a, a promise and as a, a process. And having the, the university in that area and building on the systemness, if you will, we talk about this a lot as, as chancellors, the fact that we can make connections from where we are to the rest of the state. Uh, the, the America's large research institutions are critical and invaluable pieces, but translating that to what happens on, on uh, Weeksville Road in my, my town takes a different kind of institution sometime. And so we are able to have those conversations, that idea of institutions being conveners that idea of being able to have those conversations and point to where innovation and, and op different kinds of opportunities are available, but also translating that into the local economy is part of what's important and part of what I think is a critical element of American higher education. I'm going to give one, one quick example, and, and then I'll... Uh, we did a, this was when I was at a different institution, but we were doing a study, uh, we did a study as part of a larger review of things that were going on. Uh, there was an economic uh, boom that was anticipated to come into the area. Uh, and so we were contracted to do a study to look at how this was going to impact the uh, citizens on the lowest socioeconomic level in the community when this change took place in the community. It had to do with, with the BRAC relocation of, of officers when I was down, of, of agents, when I, agencies when I was down in Fayetteville. So literally what we found was it was going to have absolutely no effect whatsoever on the people in the lowest socioeconomic run. The only way it was going to have an effect and what we started to do, what that institution started to do, was talk about the focus on intentionality and that if you don't build some kind of uh, deliberate impact in to, uh, to affect all of the people in the community, the innovations are not going to do that. So there are different, different roles for different institutions in this process. Uh, and I, I just had to plug the importance of those of us who are providing the, the, the uh, movement of students from rural schools and preparing them for your graduate programs and for other studies that, and for your laboratories and so forth. 
uh, teaching people how to do research prepares them to do research at a higher level. And so we all play significant roles in that process. Thank, Thank you. you. I think that's really important for us to have shared that perspective. And I'm going to do something kind of unusual because we've only got two minutes left on camera. We're happy to continue some questions after that. But we have two student body presidents here. Could you, you get 30 seconds or 45 seconds. How has this all sounded to you? Maybe they're going to give us the A we've been wanting on our grade card. But how does this sound to you? It's great having you here. You're the students. I'm sure there's no great inflation here. Uh, first off, uh, hello everyone. My name is Tyler Harden. I'm the UNC System Student Body President, and it's an honor to be able to serve the students all over the system. Uh, I want to thank you for continuing the conversation. I think that it's so important to highlight what works, what doesn't work, to continue to reevaluate, um, you know, how the University of North Carolina is doing. Um, and I would encourage you all to bring in more students, more student voices, and ensuring that those voices are heard. Uh, when decisions are being made. But I do want to thank you, and, and I've enjoyed soaking it all in and uh, learning a lot about the commission and hopefully the progress that will be made. Are you going to give us an A or even a B plus? <laughs> Great inflation. Uh, I, I might stick with, with the C that I heard earlier, <laughs> but, but there's still progress to be made. You're tough. Fair. Hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Adkins. I'm the student body president here at UNC Chapel Hill, and I echo everything that Tyler said, and it's an honor to be here, and I've really enjoyed getting to hear um, everyone's perspective and meeting people. I'm a first-generation college student, so this is, is all overwhelming, to say the least, for me, but to be able to hear um, more about higher education and the things that you have done and the things that you are continue, continuing to do and, and the changes that you'd like to to see is very refreshing and I'm very excited to hear that. Um, as student body president, exactly like Tyler said, it is my, my job and my responsibility to say, please bring more students in. And, and I think everyone in this room, that's who you serve at the end of the day, is, is you are here to work for the students um, and they want to speak to you and they want to share their ideas with you. Um, so I, I challenge you to bring more students into the conversation and I think you'll be um, really amazed at the things that they have to say. But thank you for all that you're doing and will continue to do. Great. Thank you. And I want you all to join me in thanking our panelists, Joe and Terry and Mark. You are a fantastic group. It's been great talking with you. And I think we're happy to continue the conversation. Um, and then we'll all be going to lunch, I think, in 15 minutes. So we have a few more minutes to do it. But please join me in thanking this amazing panel. Thank you. So I think there was another question there. I think they're going off there. Maybe they could turn these lights off. Yeah. Hi. Um, the panel was billed as talking about the future. And I haven't heard a lot about the future. And I know that, I think it was Mark Twain who said that predicting is very difficult, particularly about the future. <laughs> but I would like you to give us your thoughts about four areas. Uh, number one, the future of funding research, whether at the federal level or from other sources, because it is the engine that drives many of our research projects. And uh, my colleagues who are research scientists uh, are very nervous about the future of funding research, particularly at the federal level. Uh, the second concern is the future of quality assurance. One of the things that we tackled in the Spellings Commission was accreditation. And I haven't seen a lot of reform with respect to accreditation, and it still serves as the proxy for quality. And, and what's, the, what's the future of that in your eyes, as I think the public increasingly uh, needs to know what's good and what's bad, and how do you tell? Uh, the third area that I have noted is the question of quality instruction. We know right now that a majority of instruction in the United States is conducted by part-timers. And this is for economic reasons. Uh, institutions don't hire full-timers because they don't want to pay benefits. And so that's a cost-saving. But what is the cost to the, uh, the instructional quality, to the mentoring that's needed, uh, to curriculum development, uh, serving on needed committees, et cetera? Uh, 
What, where is the future headed on that? And finally, the, the future of student debt. We now have uh, student loan debt surpassing a trillion dollars, more than the accumulated credit card debt in this country. Now, there's something that I don't think is very sustainable. H how do we tackle those? Because I think those are at least four pretty critical future issues. So we will continue this panel for another couple of hours. <laughs> but those are really great. Maybe each person can take one of them. Um, Terry, you've been really active in the reaccreditation. You just came back from a serving. Could you, do you mind taking that one on? Because I think, I mean, they are all fantastic questions. Sure. And, um, you know, I get it about quality assurance. I think that the current accreditation process is, is pretty cumbersome, to put it mildly. We just went through it um, at UVA last year. And we spent a whole year and a lot of money um, documenting 95 standards uh, of quality that were required of us. Um, and you know, I think that probably for UVA, most of those weren't very much in doubt. But when there are schools when it's in doubt, I don't know how well the system is working then. And I think one of the problems is that our regional accreditors are trying to um, accredit you know, everything. Um, Bible colleges and technical schools and community colleges and regional schools all the way up to the R1s. And in fact, those are very different schools from one another. I don't think the same standards used at a community college are necessarily the ones that you apply at some of these other situations. Um, so I think there's probably still room there for reform. The reform I hear about most frequently is a kind of a horizontal quality assurance in which schools that are similar to one another in mission form the accreditors for one another. So doctoral granting institutions are accreditors for doctoral, community colleges are those for community colleges. I would like to see the visiting teams expanded to include some people who are not in higher education. And for example, a school superintendent, I think would, would add a lot to some of these panels, and somebody from business or industry. Uh, not to say that higher education, you know, is, is there's too much grade inflation as we look at one another. That's not necessarily the problem. It's the additional perspective some of those people would bring to us that I think would help in our quality assurance. Uh, but I do think that many people believe that system is not working as well as it should. And these are the kinds of issues that we take on in the AAU or the APLU where all the presidents come together. I think it's really, you're, you're right on the money for things that we need to do. You want to take on research? Dollars a little bit? I'm glad you gave me that one. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, it's interesting. I, um, one third of the federal R&D budget goes to 25 universities. And, um, and uh, you know, Carolina, Duke, uh, we're on that list. Michigan, obviously, and, you know, powerhouse in, in research. And make sure that we are on that list is important for our economy. Um, but, you know, the, the overhead is constantly being looked at, and I know it's being de debated in, in D.C. Those are real costs. You know, it's, it's really uh, expensive to do research and the infrastructure to support it and uh, uh, waste handling and animal uh, usage and training and safety and all the regulations that are really, really important to do research safely. Those things cover. So I, I worry about people not understanding what those dollars are being used for to support, to keep the lights on and, and to allow research to take place. So I do worry about it. I, I really worry too for young faculty. Um, it's a much different environment today to do research than it was when I came out and, and it must be daunting actually. Um, and, and, the, and the dialogue is challenging. So I, I too worry about that, but I, you know, I think put it in context, and you know, we in North Carolina in particular need to be effective in federal dollars coming to our state, and we've got to make sure we understand, you know, what we're doing to do that. In the 1970s, 70% 70 of the research and development was done in business and industry, 30% in universities. It has completely switched. It's 70% in your universities, 30% and, and shrinking. So if we don't develop the public partnerships with private industries and we don't get more money coming federally, that critical pipeline that we've been talking about mm -hmm. fueling our institutions would really dry up. So Mark, do you want to take on a little bit about the, uh, both the, how is education actually cha changing and also our faculty that are not tenure track? 
mm -hmm. and their role, and how can we be better at supporting them? I'm sure. passing I just want to add a little coda uh, to what Joe said on research funding. Um, I think we should be heartened, actually, by the fact that uh, both the House and the Senate committees that reported out their budgets um, presented uh, budgets that far exceeded the administration's recommendation, that rejected the notion of uh, the false savings by cutting overhead, which is in effect cutting research the, just the same. So there is a strong constituency still in the House and the Senate in support of biomedical and other types of research. So it's, it's uh, we're not out of the woods, but the doom and gloom of the administration's proposal, uh, we're, we're not gonna head there. And that's a very heartening thing. Um, but, okay, just to add uh, to what Carol wanted me to address, um, uh, the quality of teaching and the role of non-tenure stream faculty, lecturers, and adjuncts. So um, all institutions rely uh, on a mixture of people to do the teaching. Uh, my institution has a very low fraction of its faculty uh, outside the tenure stream, 10% or so, so it's relatively low. Others are much more. Um, I think the real issue is making sure that the quality of the teaching is very high and then the equity issue of making sure that the people who are teaching are being paid appropriately for their teaching expertise. So I loved teaching intro biology when I was at Berkeley earlier in my career. Um, there were other members of my faculty uh, in my department that I never would have allowed to teach that course because <laughs> they weren't very good teachers. Uh, there are lecturers that are superb teachers. So I don't have an inherent problem with outstanding lecturers uh, uh, with quality control uh, delivering part of the curriculum at our universities. Research universities, some of the value added at research universities is you learn from people that are defining the frontiers, that are asking the questions. And that's a different type of education that you get from even an outstanding lecturer who truly and deeply understands a discipline but isn't actively engaged in scholarship in that discipline. Uh, and I guess since we're being told to wrap up, I think all of our institutions can do a better job um, uh, assuring the quality of teaching with the same level of stringency that we measure the quality of research. Uh, so we're research universities, uh, but we're also uh, committed teaching universities. Our faculty have to be incentivized to apply the same creativity to their teaching as they do to their research. So because I'm chairing it, I get to do the wrap-up question on debt very quickly. I think what you've heard all day is that there is actually quite a diversity in the landscape of higher education. Most of our students, our average debt is about $17,000 after four years, and they're doing extremely well. All of us give more than half of our students financial aid and help them meet that full need. And when you look at that and what they get, very few of them are really suffering from debt, but that doesn't mean debt is not enormously important in many different institutions, and it's particularly important for students that do not graduate. So as we think of all this, and if you look at that, who pays their loans back, who doesn't, a lot of it's about graduation. These are the challenges. Keep the costs low, find the aid, and then help people graduate so that debt is much less a part of the defining way they think about higher education. So, Carol, can I just say one thing? Yes. <laughs> We're never going to stop. A, a very disproportionate part of that debt is from the for-profit institutions. It is. You do have to keep that in mind. It is. That's the elephant in the room. Yes. Well, we'll have a chance to talk to everybody at lunch, and we'll have two amazing talks from Governor Hunt and President Spellings after lunch. And again, thank you all for being here and part of this. <laughs>